So, So can you uh, uh, can you see it uh, full screen? Uh, it's a black screen for me right now. It was working like uh, a minute ago. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Now, can you see it uh, full screen? Oh, I can see the each slide. They're not like exactly full screen, but I can see them definitely. Like you can see two slides. Uh, I can see two slides at a time, yes. Uh, what you have right now is like the biggest, biggest slide so far. It covers most of the screen. Mm. Sorry for the uh, delay. Now is it one one slide or two slides? It's good now. Yes. One slide. Okay, perfect. So, I think we can start. Um, so, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to give this talk uh, for this uh, exciting um, hackathon. And uh, I'll I'll go on actually admitting people as they um, come in. Um, so. Um, it's a great pleasure for me. I work at uh, the Scripps Research Translational Institute in uh, uh, San Diego, and I'm, I'm giving this talk on uh, machine learning for digital medicine, which is a really exciting direction, a really exciting application of uh, machine learning. Um, during the talk, I'll I want to keep it very open. Um, so if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to just interrupt me. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer in real time. And we'll try also to, um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, uh, on the chat, on the Zoom chat. So feel free just to write a message in the chat and um, uh, I'll try to answer in real time. All right. Uh, let me start. Uh, I would like first of all to just say a couple of words about uh, uh, myself, just to that you have an idea what what has been my career path so far, and then we'll dive into machine learning in in in, in, in its way really to revolutionize the the world of medicine. So first of all, I started with um, um, working with wireless sensor network. This was part of my PhD at the University of Padova in Italy, and um, just a warm-up question. Uh, do you guys have an idea of how old was uh, this university uh, in Italy? Anybody can try to make a guess. Um, you can even write a number if you want in the, uh, in the chat. I'll give, you, I'll give you a small hint. Uh, the University of Padova is the second university, oldest university in the world. Anybody want to Try to just put whatever number you have in mind, maybe 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 300 years. 
Oh, good. Any anything else? So it's a little bit older than that. Uh, it is uh, exactly 798 years. It was funded in 1222, so almost 800 years ago. Uh, just a little bit of the history of, uh, of the region where I come from, so Italy. Indeed, uh, as part of my PhD, uh, again, in wireless network, um, I also spent some time at the University of Oulu. Uh, this is the really north of Europe, so this in Finland. And that's an idea that, well, of course, a place full of snow with very little light. If you see in the map here, it's a really cool place. It's uh, um, more or less at the same um, height, latitude as, uh, say, center Alaska, uh, compared to what we have here. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, not uh, a very beautiful place to, to be. So, um, I work on wireless network and then I, I decided to move somehow to uh, UC San Diego. Um, this is about 10 years ago. And I started working with the uh, wearable sensor and, uh, and e-health. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, um, as you see this, uh, this guy here in the bottom right of the slide, he's wearing a couple of sensors, um, um, a smartwatch and uh, a number of sensor on the chest. So these are great tools. So I got really excited in working with them. Basically, uh, the idea here is that we are measuring what's happening in real time, what's happening inside your, um, inside your body. So for example, here we were measuring a lot of signal from electrical signals from your heart. Uh, now the big, uh, the big point here is, well, um, we are working uh, here with a few dozen people um, to really make an impact in the world of research. We need much more. And this is why I moved to the Scripps Research uh, Translational Institute, which is just on the other side of the street from uh, UCSD, so not far away. Uh, but we are working, um, I'm working with um, a few cardiologists really famous cardiologist uh, in, in the US. And we have access all of a sudden to not a few hundred, uh, but a few hundred thousands individuals. Um, as an example, we are collaborating with, uh, with Fitbit. And um, uh, you know, Fitbit is providing us data from 200,000 individuals. And we'll see it uh, for the talk. So this is, a great opportunity uh, of, of really finding out something new from, uh, from these signals. But uh, let me tell you, um, potentially the most exciting uh, concept uh, that, that we are working with, which is the one of digital medicine. Um, first of all, have you ever uh, heard about the, this definition of digital medicine? Uh, is there anybody who has, um, who has an idea of, um, or wants to tell us what, what is digital medicine? And uh, again, feel free to write in the chat if, uh, if you don't want to, to speak. No guess? Includes M health? Um, yes. Yes, it, uh, it does. Um, using technology to solve medical problems, uh, yes. Um, so this very, very true. Thank you very much uh, to, to, to both of you. The idea here, uh, I would say it's, it's even a little bit deeper uh, than, than just using technology. And this really goes back to, uh, to, to the very beginning of, uh, of medicine, uh, of, of let's say of modern medicine or Western medicine. Uh, this goes back um, to uh, Hippocrates. This is 2,500 uh, uh, years ago. And he said that uh, we should, first of all, look at the person more than the disease itself. The idea is we need to understand the person, understand how the person is working. And based on that, uh, 
we will be able to uh, you know, cure the person and, and figure out what, what disease the person has and so on. So uh, this may seem abstract, but it's a really powerful concept. We need to understand the individual. Each individual is really different and we need to understand the physiology and the, the history of the individual before we can, uh, we can even think about curing him or her. Now, uh, this is very complicated. A physician um, is spending approximately maybe five or 10 minutes uh, per, per patient. And um, this is really not enough time to look at all the history of, of this individual. This is where digital medicine really start to play um, an important role. With three main things, uh, so we want to look, look at the individual. Uh, how do we do it? We use wearable sensors, which are a fantastic tool to really measure the individual continuously and passively without the individual doing anything besides, well, recharging the device every now and then and doing this for very long, for years, or potentially for a lifetime. Now, this enormous amount of data co collected continuously from each individual cannot be just presented to a physician. A physician has no idea what to do with that. This is why we need artificial intelligence, or machine learning if you want. Some automatic technique to analyze the data and destruct the relevant information from the data without uh, a person doing anything with that. So let's go deeper in, in, in this direction of, uh, of AI and let's see what, uh, what we can do with that. So uh, first of all, a classical view on uh, AI in medicine, um, it all starts from a very simple observation. Well, uh, a radiologist, an important clinical figure, is spending uh, her own career uh, in looking at approximately 10 million images. So a radiologist is, is really looking at potentially hundreds, uh, if not thousands of images per day, 10 million images over, over a, a whole career. A dermatologist, She's looking at about 200,000 skin lesions uh, over the course of, uh, of her career. Now, we know that AI is doing a great job in looking at images. And uh, well, we're starting to see now a couple of very successful stories of AI basically not replacing, but really doing as well as um, uh, a clinical figure in just analyzing images. But let's do a step back and see how AI can really do that and uh, what are the issues and how do we solve them. So I think a really important date uh, is uh, 2004. Um, I regret to say that in, in 2004, I was not even super young. Um, uh, I, I guess I guess you guys were much younger than me in in, in that year. Um, anyhow, in two thousand and four, uh, DARPA, which is an, um, a federal agency, uh, started uh, uh, a competition. Or well, uh, something similar to uh, the hackathon you're you're going through, uh, but really open to any researchers um, around the U.S. and uh, with a really big prize, I think, of the order of $100,000. Uh, $100, uh, and uh, the, the, the project to be done, uh, well, the goal was quite simple. We wanted a car to drive for 150 miles through the desert somewhere in, uh, in Nevada. Now, um, nowadays, we, uh, we are accustomed to this, uh, we're used to this idea of self-driving car, but back then there was no self-driving car. And so a lot of researchers started working on that. And uh, well, in the middle of the desert, of course, there is no risk of, of whatever, um, killing anybody. It's just a car uh, going crashing over, um, over a couple of rocks. And um, in 
did, nobody succeeded back then. So nobody was able to drive actually more than, I think, five or 10 miles. Uh, and then uh, the car was just crashing. There was really a, a wrong concept here. Uh, each car uh, was programmed to really hard coded program to recognize the rock from a shadow, from you know anything you could find in the desert. But this turns out to be a really, really difficult uh, task, and nobody uh, was able to, you know, basically teach the car how to how to um, you know. Um, recognize through their camera how to recognize objects and uh, drive through the desert. Now, just one year after, uh, the same uh, challenge uh, went in a really different way. And, um, and the car succeeded, uh, not one group, but actually a few of them succeeded in driving this 150 miles. Any idea of uh, what happened in, in just one year? And uh, what was the difference that concept that allow the car to drive through any any guess ai well that's uh well yes that's basically ai of course we are talking about ai uh this is uh, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great answer so the concept became different and uh, they started to apply um, a proper AI, let's say. So they started to apply machine learning. Machine learning is, 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 is a pretty important concept. And uh, uh, this, this funny figure that you see on the bottom right here somehow explain it is the machine learning uh, by, by itself. So instead of telling the car, oh, um, everything that looks like this is, is a rock, so you should avoid it. And uh, everything that looks like that is a shadow, so it, the, there is no problem there. Uh, we basically let the car learn by itself. So we are basically driving and the car learns, well, with, uh, with fantastic machine learning algorithms, but the car learns by itself how to move around. So uh, this is the, the concept of, uh, of machine learning and uh, well, what is special? Um, do you have any idea of uh, where machine learning is used nowadays? For example, uh, in the internet, uh, what is a big application uh, in the internet of, of machine learning? Any guess? Disease detection? Well, yes, you're really going uh, to the end. This is, this is totally true. Uh, we are, we're doing that uh, in the application in medicine, really in the internet, in, in your everyday life. Automated responses? Yes. Um, that's a good one. Automated responses to, 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 to what exactly? If we look at the internet. Google? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. That's a big one, a really big one. So let's focus on Google. Um, so we're basically asking Google and Google is, 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 is always answering um, most of, of, of our question. And uh, a big thing we're doing in the internet, or at least um, people of my age is, is, are, are doing in the internet is looking at pictures of cats. You're there in the evening, you have nothing to do. You just look for cats and there are cats images and videos always very relaxing and funny and so on. So that's, a, that's just a funny example, of course, but um, um, it really gets the concept. So uh, Google needs to be able to recognize a cat from um, an image that is not a cat. This is not, this is not trivial. It's trivial for any human being, of course, uh, but, but not for a computer. And there are two ways to do that. Again, we can teach Google what are really the features of a cat. So you should recognize the ears, the eyes, 
uh, the nose and so on, and, uh, and, and trying to, 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 to really recognize a cat from another image that is not a cat, or uh, we can apply machine learning. Uh, if we do the first, we risk to fail, basically, as we will build up an enormous program just to teach Google to recognize a cat. And then uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm searching for dogs, and, and Google has no idea how to do it. On the other side, using machine learning, we can really solve the problem. Basically, with machine learning, we, give, we feed Google with a million, let's say, images of cats and the millions of images that are not cats, we just tell him uh, it, uh, well, this is cats, this is not cat, and it learns how to recognize a cat. So whenever we give a new image, uh, Google will be able to say, yeah, this is a cat. Uh, same thing uh, with dogs. So we don't need to reprogram it. We just need to fit again a million images of, um, of a dog, for example. Now, why is this so important? Well, this same exact concept uh, are used also for recognition of important illnesses. Um, as you see here, for example, uh, this is the case of, uh, of a skin lesion uh, that needs to be determined if it's a cancer or not. Or uh, this is the retinal fundus images, um, which is the inner part of your eye. Interestingly, uh, Google itself is uh, really active in um, collaborating with, uh, with our clinical researchers uh, in this space. And uh, they made a great job really in, um, in, in helping out and basically being as good as a clinician and recognizing these images. With the same exact algorithms that, uh, that they used again, to discriminate cat and dogs in the internet. They use it also for clinical images. They need, of course, the same size. So they need 100,000 uh, images before the algorithm is able to do uh, a good job in this classification. All right. Um, this, uh, the, the idea is, is, not, is not finished here. Uh, we can go, um, in, in my group, we have worked uh, extensively, for example, uh, with another type of signals, which is the, the ECG, as basically the electrical signal from your heart. Uh, your heart, every time uh, it is pulsing, is, is basically emitting a very specific type of electrical signal. We can detect it. And uh, with these signals, we can really diagnose different issues. Um, in, in this case, we are looking for atrial fibrillation, some sort of uh, irregular rhythm of, of the heart, which has a lot of very important uh, clinical consequences. Um, um, in particular, a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke. So, uh, it's another really interesting problem. Um, the type of signals are, are shown here. So we have a time series of, of, of data. And uh, on the top here, you see a normal sinus rhythm. So everything is good here. On the second one, you see atrial fibrillation. This is a patient with a really irregular uh, rhythm. Um, as you see, the distances between uh, the different beats uh, which are the peaks here, is, is really irregular. So you have, um, you know, maybe one very uh, fast pulse and then waits a little bit and then there is another pulse and so on. So an arrhythmia are really um, an issue that, uh, that we need to detect. Uh, how did we do that? Uh, well, we looked at, uh, first of all, uh, clinical features, so we try to uh, to do the same job as uh, as a clinician would do, uh, looking at um, really the shape or whatever the features that a clinician will look at, and on the other side we applied uh, uh, deep learning. So we are basically doing the same thing that uh, Google, for example, is doing with images. Um, we are just doing it now with with a time series of data. And the idea here is, again, uh, be able to do some sort of a classification and divide uh, really uh, people that are healthy, that people that, that have some, uh, some specific issue. 
And I don't want to go too, too deep here. Uh, the idea here really is to find out what is the gap? What is, how much better can we do with deep learning with respect to using classical uh, features or using the same features that, uh, that a clinician uh, would use? Uh, I have an important question at this point. So on one side, uh, there is the clinician who is doing uh, all this, uh, the interpretation of the ECG, suggesting maybe a therapy. And on the other side, we have this deep learning. It's even for scientists, it's basically a black box. We have an input, we observe an output, which is uh, patient is okay or no, patient is, is not okay. We need to do something. But we have no idea how is this work and what is there really behind. So this brings us to, to a question and I, I would really like uh, uh, all of you as th there is not a correct answer here. There are always only opinion. The question is the, the following. So suppose uh, we are looking at the signals and uh, we have uh, a fully explainable algorithm. What does it mean? Basically an algorithm that that can really talk to a clinician and can really explain to the clinician, oh, I'm, I looked at this particular piece here of the signal and this, this is uh, making me think that this is uh, whatever, atrial fibrillation. So uh, this is fully explainable, but it has only an 80% accuracy. So it means that uh, eight times out of 10, it is correct and uh, twice it is not. On the other side, we have a completely black box approach. So this means there is no explanation. There is just a classification at the end. But the accuracy here is, is 95%. So that's correct, 19 times out of 20. So much more than, uh, than the other one. Now, uh, which of the two is preferable? Or if you want, which of the two would you like to be, um, suppose that, um, that you or, 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 or some, someone close to you needs to be uh, analyzed? And uh, which of the two would you prefer to have? I see a 95%, so the, the black box. Um, so it seems that everybody here uh, really likes the black box. Uh, um, it's great, I think it's really, um, it's really typical, um, I would say, of, uh, of, of young people and scientists, and, and, and they really like it. Of course, it's more accurate. You have a, a better chance to be correct. Uh, there are indeed, uh, we need to understand that there are indeed, um, because uh, it's going to be used for future prediction. Yes, yes. There are, uh, th this is great too, actually, to really look at how do we uh, improve uh, deep learning. Thank you, um, uh, Adam. So, uh, we want a deep learning, uh, but, but clinicians, don't like it much and um, let me explain in why so a clinician has no way to verify that this is correct or not the deep learning is not telling i'm looking at this very specific piece of, of signal and that is a problem because at the very end the clinician is responsible for saying yes this patient is okay or this patient is not so we need to find a way to have the clinician involved otherwise the clinician would say well I, I cannot trust it as, as, yeah, it may be accurate, maybe not. I have no way to verify it. And, and, and uh, I'm going back to the old method. So uh, there is a lot of research now to really try to explain to the clinician, oh, this is, this is why we are doing this or that. And uh, this is the word of explainable AI. And I just uh, put there the word, but um, it's really, really interesting. And if you go on with your studies, um, I think uh, you will find great satisfaction in, in working also in, in, in this area and trying to explain uh, what the deep learning is, is doing. So, but uh, let's go on. 
um, let's go on to the next step, really, of, uh, of, of what we want to do. Um, we want to look now at the data more longitudinally. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a great interest in following the individual, not, not just for one short clinical exam inside the, inside the hospital, but really for long, for years. And uh, the idea here is to use these this wearable devices. I, I myself actually have uh, plenty of them. Um, uh, we are testing uh, several. And they, they are really a fantastic tool as uh, you just wear them and, and they go on measuring yourself. Now, what can we do uh, with this with these wearable devices? Well, a, a really fascinating study has been done by, uh, by Apple itself. Uh, it's called the Apple Heart Study. It is really doing the same as, as we discussed a minute ago. It's trying to detect atrial fibrillation using your smartwatch. Now, the great thing of this study is that apples have millions of people uh, wearing an Apple Watch. And so uh, it just asked these people, do you want to participate to the study? And uh, 400,000 participants decided to participate it and basically donated their data uh, for this study. Now, this is fantastic as uh, in, in, inside the clinic is, is basically impossible uh, to get uh, 400,000 participants uh, while with this, new, um, with this new way, basically looking at people who already own um, uh, a smartwatch and an Apple watch in this case, uh, all of a sudden uh, we've been able to, to work with 400,000 participants. So they have been followed for eight months and um, uh, at the end, uh, 400 people have been uh, reported with atrial fibrillation. So uh, a great result. Well, one out of a thousand is, is not a big number, uh, but uh, these are mostly young and healthy people. Of course, if we look at the older population, uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll get a much higher percentage of people with atrial fibrillation that could be detected in advance using uh, a smartwatch. But that's not the end of the story. We can do so much more uh, with, uh, with wearables. And, uh, and uh, that's the next step. So you see uh, at this image, uh, this guy, um, this guy is, is doing um, uh, a sleep exam. Uh, a sleep exam is called a polysomnography. And um, a polysomnography is you're basically spending uh, a night inside the uh, inside the hospital and um, they just monitor your sleep it's a great tool they really tell you a lot about your sleep stages the sleep cycles they identify any problem with your sleep the main issue is i can assure you that this is not really comfortable so you're spending one night in the hospital um you are equipped with all these cables and you're supposed to sleep with all this stuff. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite funny, as soon as you move a little bit um, and the sensor gets out of its position, a nurse on the other uh, room uh, just sees it and uh, comes back to your room and fix the sensor and, and wish you good night again. So, um, not to mention the fact that it, this is quite expensive. It may cost an estimated of a thousand five hundred dollars um, for for this one night in the lab, and and so on. If there are a bigger problem, this is not your normal night of sleep. Uh, this is one specific night that you're spending in a different environment inside the hospital. They cannot really measure how how do you normally sleep. Now, we can do something really different by looking again at wearable devices. And this is a great study I've done uh, with, uh, with a few colleagues at uh, Scripps Research. We look at 200,000 individuals followed for over two years uh, wearing a Fitbit device. Uh, this is a collaboration with Fitbit. And we try to figure out really how much people sleep. 
And the figure here uh, you see in green, uh, our estimation of sleep based on, on this data, most of the people sleep around seven hours. And in blue, you see instead how much people report to do they sleep. So this is a CDC study um, that calling 400,000 people and asking how much they sleep. And it seems that people you know, tend to say that they sleep more than, than they actually sleep. Uh, there are many more people that say that they sleep eight hours and some of them say it even nine, 10 or 11 hours on average, which uh, uh, almost never happened but, uh, uh, by looking at, uh, at the device. Now, uh, what can we learn here? Well, there are really interesting pattern uh, for example, um, you know, if we looked here in, in red actually as uh, the, the average sleep for female, in blue is for males. It looks like uh, females are sleeping a little bit more. In the y-axis here we have hours, uh, so this is six, six hours and a half, this is almost uh, seven hours. It seems that, again, uh, women are sleeping consistently about 10 or 15 minutes longer. Saturday and Sunday, of course, uh, we're sleeping uh, a little bit more. And there is also some seasonal trend that seems that we're sleeping a little bit less, like about 10 minutes less um, in June and, and July. But the, the, the story gets even more interesting if we look at, uh, at the individuals. So uh, let's see these four individuals here. This is the distribution of the sleep for a single individual, so for four uh, single individuals. Let's look, for example, at what is happening here in the right. For this individual, um, well, she's sleeping most of the time, around six hours, uh, but it seems that she's sleeping for some days, uh, something between eight and nine hours. These are probably weekends in which uh, she's sleeping a little bit longer. Uh, or this guy here on the total left, this is most probably a college student. Uh, and it has a totally disrupted sleep. It can be anything between five and 10 hours, which is very, pretty much typical of people in, in college. And uh, well, uh, th there is a really big variability between one day and another, totally random. Or this guy here instead is sleeping consistently around seven hours uh, over, uh, so most of the days is sleeping around seven hours. So we associated sleep uh, with body mass index, which is um, you know, basically um, a measure that is calculated of what what's your weight should be depending also on your height. And uh, we've seen that for people with a smaller body mass index, uh, so let's say uh, um, they, they have a mean sleep duration, which is a little bit higher. For people overweight, uh, they basically sleep less. And as you see here in the right, we also notice that people overweight uh, tends to have uh, a really high variability in sleep. So they have a really disrupted somehow uh, sleep pattern. So uh, this is about sleep. Uh, we can look at much more from, uh, from this sensor. We can look at resting heart rate, for example. Uh, this is another really cool parameter. Uh, resting heart rate is one value per day of your heart rate. And um, this is basically recorded just before, in the morning, just before you, uh, you, you wake up. Uh, so this is really your heart rate when you are, when you're really relaxed. Um, and the figure here, uh, we see that uh, it, it is all over the place. So there are people who have a resting heart rate of 40 or 50 pulls per minute, and some other people may have a resting heart rate of 80 or 90 pulls per minute. So um, this is really, you know, dependence on the individual. There is nothing bad in having uh, uh, a lower or a higher uh, resting heart rate, but it's something that is really personal. The idea here is that an individual like uh, the one we see here in the left, this is the resting heart rate over the course of 12 months. And this is really, really uh, constant as, as you see here, it's around 67 pulls per minute, a little bit more, a little bit less. And uh, for some other individuals, uh, we have this 
range peaks here. So this is really cool. Uh, this individual also have an average resting heart rate of around 67, but for a short period, probably a week, uh, the resting heart rate goes up to 80. Um, what's happening here? Do, do you guys have any idea of, um, so we have noticed that and uh, we spent actually quite a bit of time trying to figure out what was, what was this, what are these peaks? Um, you see one here and you see one, for example, uh, here for the, the third individual. Um, she's also having about 67 pulse per minute on average and then a high peak up to 80. Maybe was doing more athletic for a week uh, than stop for the next few weeks. Um, that's a great observation. Um, this is, um, that's not what it's happening as uh, you can change your resting heart rate, but really slowly. Uh, resting heart rate again is not your real time heart rate, uh, but it's your heart rate uh, when you're at rest. So, it's changing really slowly. The person might be more tense during the time. Uh, this is true. Uh, that can be. So you may have an. Uh, um, you may have an. Um, so sorry. Going back to uh, to the observation of the athletic. So it changes, but it changes over months, not over days. So you don't have this. You may have a trend, not a, such a peak. Uh, the person may be tensed, uh, that, that may happen um, much more quickly uh, and yeah, that, that may get resolved maybe in, in a week or so. And when you are tense, you know, your whole day is, is really tense and even when you sleep, you're not sleeping well. So yeah, that, that can be. And uh, we went a step over um, in, in this direction. Uh, so yeah, just to to show you uh, for, for the first one uh, who said, no, who uh, you were, uh, Jadav, I think, uh, you were mentioning uh, about the athletic one. So there is a trend and this is the trend, uh, the average for all the people from, uh, for all the 12 months. And you see that uh, basically the resting heart rate is decreasing on average and getting to a minimum around uh, July or August and getting up to a really maximum at the end of December. Well, I think this is really related to what we eat and especially how much uh, sport do we do. And after we do sport, the resting heart rate is, is slightly decreasing. Uh, but let's go back out the, to the tense one. Um, well, here there are a lot of trends, um, um, uh, changes with age, BMI, and so on. Let's go back to the tense one indeed. So this, this unusual, changes uh, and this is another individual again around 65 pulse per minute and then going up and uh, here we see days now on the x-axis and uh, the affected to uh, such season affected disorder peaks are uh, entire winter months yeah uh, that's uh, thank you uh, Adwaite this is um, another great observation yes it's it's seasonal um, it may be a seasonal disorder um, here, and, and that would be for sure true for some people. Uh, here, I think more about the, uh, educate, uh, the uh, athletic uh, effort as, as this is really averaged out over the 200,000 people and uh, well, everybody is, is affected in, in, in some way. Uh, it's um, athletic schedule. Uh, you said that there is more variability in women's resting heart rate. Do you mean uh, more women are variability with? Oh, that's like another great question. Um, let me go back to. Well, uh, this is the variability for each single woman. And thank you for asking. And um, we can refer actually here to the E, um, the third. Uh, um, the third image here. So the question is really about women and why women has a higher variability. Uh, this is quite interesting. This is related to the menstrual cycle. Um, so there is some periodicity in women and it, the resting heart rate is affected significantly. It can go up and down, like in this case, it goes down as 63 and uh, within a month, it goes up to 72 and then goes down again to 63. 
So uh, women have a very, uh, you know, monthly uh, cycle also in, in resting heart rate, and it is possible to observe it by just looking again at your smartwatch and looking at the changing and resting heart rate. Yeah, you got an idea also of, of the menstrual cycle. And this is highlighted, for example, here in the very bottom left uh, figure, we show the variability of resting heart rate as a function of age for uh, males in this light blue and for women in, um, in, in green. And, and you see that women have a higher variability with respect to men, at least till the age of 40 or 50, so in childbearing age. And then they go back to uh, the same variability as, uh, as men. So this is another really interesting thing that you can observe by looking at this 200,000 people. Uh, we can start studying also um, the variability for women and their, uh, their menstrual cycle there. So um, let's go on um, as we are uh, close to, uh, to the end of my time. So great, uh, we are looking at, uh, at these big changes. And now um, our hypothesis here is that the changes is uh, thank thank you for the question. The changes is uh, uh, is is related to an infection. So this is an hypothesis. I have no way to verify it directly. So how do we verify it? How do we figure out if this is really an infection or not? Well, uh, it's not an easy question. Uh, it may or may not. So what? Uh, what we decided to do is to look at, uh, at some statistics. And so the CDC is giving us the, the um, number of people with uh, an influenza-like illness uh, every year and uh, um, for every week really of the year. And so we said, well, from this big data, from this 200,000 people, uh, we can, we can, uh, from this 200,000 people, uh, we can see, okay, what is the percentage of these people that, that show something abnormal in the resting heart rate uh, at any given day of the year? And let's try to correlate it to see if there is a correlation with uh, the, uh, the number of people with influenza like kidneys. And uh, uh, this is a great work from my colleague, Jennifer Reading, and she's been able to show that Yes, there is a difference, there is a correlation, and we can somehow follow uh, the, the number of people with influenza-like illness, uh, as it, it has been shown here with California and Texas. So we are able to, to use this data to say, well, uh, in this region here, uh, for these people that we are observing, uh, there is a high incidence of um, some influenza-like illness. So we are able to predict that there is influenza-like illness in, in that area. Now, uh, this, is, this is fantastic, and this could be a, a really big tool uh, in the future for tracking influenza-like illness. It, it's important, actually, to tell in which area uh, we have an outbreak. And as you can imagine, this was a work done in, in January of this year. Uh, there was uh, a great timing in, in saying, well, now we have uh, an even bigger emergency, uh, well, a much bigger emergency, COVID-19, how, um, how do we contribute there? How do we track COVID-19 and how can we help here? So, uh, well, I think I have no, um, no, uh, everybody knows how big of an issue uh, COVID is. Uh, this is number from April that becomes the number one cause of death. We have 200,000 cases, uh, um, almost close to 300,000 now, uh, almost 3,000 deaths um, uh, per, per day. 100,000 uh, uh, people are currently hospitalized in the US. So it's, it's, it's an enormous uh, health problem. What mm -hmm. we want to do is, um, well, we, we want to, to track it in some way. Uh, so initially, uh, people were just tracking fever. Um, I've been, uh, many people measured my fever entering uh, the sh shops uh, well, back a couple of months ago. They showed that fever is not a great uh, thing 
likely to do. Um, uh, not everybody with COVID has fever. Actually, it seems that only um, something like 30% or 40% uh, show a significant fever of people that tested positive for COVID. Uh, so we are missing many of them and many people may have fever for some other reason uh, unrelated to COVID. Uh, so that's not a great tool. Uh, also, we should consider that uh, that's a lot of people are asymptomatic. So a lot of people don't really show any symptoms and they may still have COVID and they may still spread the virus. So we need to identify them too, just to tell them and to suggest them uh, to, to take take care of this and uh, to not spread the virus to other people that may become really symptomatic and may encounter really big issues. So how do we want to do that? Well, we want to use our experience with, uh, with wearable data and, and use this data to really try to predict um, the occurrence of, of COVID-19. So we launched back in March um, a huge study which is called DETECT. And you're very welcome if you want to learn a little bit more about DETECT, uh, you can visit uh, uh, the website uh, detectstudy.org or, uh, or you can uh, get a look at, um, at our paper which has been published in Nature Medicine, uh, Wearable Sensor Data and Self-Reported Symptoms for COVID-19 Detection. So we started this, this great app. Um, this is an app you can download it, it it's, it's free, and uh, it connects with your uh, wearable device. And it basically does uh, two things. Uh, it, 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 um, it, it, uh, it reads your data, uh, it analyzes your data, and uh, it basically asks you how, how you're feeling and uh, you can report uh, any symptoms you have over the course of the year or if you're healthy you just don't do anything you just look at the data and, and analyze that we have a, a big response so we have 37,000 individuals now in the u.s that uh, decided to um, join this uh, this study and uh, we have some really exciting results uh, so for the first 30,000 individuals uh, we looked really at, um, especially at the people who got tested for COVID, and uh, we tried to discriminate, to, to divide actually, to figure out who, is, who tested positive and who tested negative based on their wearable data. So the data we are looking at are really this ones. So on, on one side, uh, self-reported uh, symptoms and the self-reported test results that people enter uh, in the app, uh, in case they have any symptoms, of course. And on the other side, we're looking at the data from, uh, from the, 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 the smartwatch of this, uh, these individuals. Could be a Fitbit, uh, a Garmin, an Apple Watch, anything that uh, connects to the app. And we are looking at three big dimensions. One is the resting heart rate that, that we have analyzed. One is the sleep, day by day uh, amount of sleep. And the third one is the amount of activity. And we are looking at changes, um, again, at this peaks here, uh, changes in, uh, in these three measures. And uh, we want to figure out uh, if these changes are a good predictor for COVID-19 and uh, can tell us potentially before we, do, we get tested if we have uh, um, COVID-19. Uh, the goal is huge, right? Uh, these people may just, you know, uh, wear their wearables and uh, use their smartwatch, a smartphone. Not, they don't need to do anything. And as soon as something is going wrong, uh, they may get alerted and they may be invited to, for example, to a COVID-19 test or, uh, you know, just um, be at home and not spread the virus to family, friends, or uh, or colleagues at work. So first of all about symptoms, uh, we notice a big difference in, in symptoms for people who tested positive or negative to COVID-19. Um, some of them are particularly good in identifying uh, COVID. For example, uh, well, the well-known decreasing taste of smell is much more prominent for uh, COVID-positive 
uh, in an Apple Watch. Um, so they are not in the Apple Watch with an, uh, thank you, um, this was a question from uh, Jadhav, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, they are not uh, in an Apple Watch. They are, you can use the Apple Watch uh, to, and connect it to, to the app. So if you want to participate, you basically uh, will visit the techstudy.org and uh, you can download the app and then the data is connected to the app. So uh, the app will connect with your uh, Apple Watch and then the app will tell you, uh, will show you your data and, and so on and so forth. You're welcome. So uh, symptoms, uh, the chrysanthesis smell is a great predictor. So as you see here in orange, we have COVID positive, but about 40% of COVID positive that um, self-report the chrysanthesis smell and only uh, about five or ten percent of COVID negative. Difficult in breathing is is another one, which is uh, a great in discriminating or cough uh, for for what it matters. And uh, well, these figures uh, they are um, sensitivity and specificity curves. Um, no need to go uh, too much deeper into how they are uh, designed. The main idea here is we'll look at resting heart rate, sleep, and activity first separately, then all together. And uh, we try to make this, this discrimination between uh, COVID positive and COVID negative. So we try to identify COVID positive people. And we used also uh, the self reported symptoms. We design a big algorithm and uh, we we've been able to reach a quite good performance. So the area under the curve here is, is a value. Uh, if, uh, if the area under the core curve is one, that's a perfect uh, um, identification. If it is the minimum value is actually 0 0.5, that would be basically a random choice, uh, let's say, so no information. And uh, we've reached a very significant number, which is uh, 0 0.8 here. Um, it's, it's very significant uh, with respect to uh, some other similar work. So we are able with a decent um, accuracy to distinguish between positive and negative. If you look at sensitivity and specificity, this basically means that uh, for positive people, so for people who have COVID-19, uh, we, uh, we can identify three out of four of them. And for negative people, we can correctly say that they are negative for three out of four of them. So that's not a perfect classification, but it's good enough uh, to give an, an initial, an initial um, information and just a suggestion of you know, taking care of yourself and potentially go and have a, and have a uh, a test. Uh, thank you, uh, Chada. So, uh, thank you for attending. So, um, I, I want to conclude here for um, for everybody, and we are a little bit out of time. Um, I want to invite all of you uh, to consider um, uh, for for your future th this big area of digital medicine. This is uh, a super interesting area, and I believe this would be a direction to really change the future of medicine, to really change the way we, we take care of patients. And uh, there are three main uh, directions here. One is the wearables. So really working in the designing and developing new wearable uh, sensors. They will allow this passive longitudinal monitoring of people. So they will really allow us to look inside ourselves uh, longitudinally for years and, and really tracking as soon as possible if anything is not going right. The second big area uh, that, that you may consider is the one of artificial intelligence. So we, how do we look at, all, at this enormous amount of data and um, how do we extract information from there? Um, this I think would, it's going to be super, super interesting and we're just scratching the surface now and in looking at this huge amount of data collected. 
the third one is of course the one of personalized medicine so this is more on the clinical side to really be uh, becoming potentially a doctor and and really being wise of these changes and really promote these changes inside the clinic and then really you know figuring out a better way to treat patients uh, so the clinician would also be involved in this uh, in this big you know, of course will play an, a really important role in this uh, big change. So uh, I think this concludes my talk. Um, I want to give space uh, if there is any, any questions at the end. Um, I'd be really happy to, to answer them. And you can ask them in the chat or uh, you know, just activate your uh, microphone and uh, we can discuss directly. If you see me uh, looking right, it's because my chat is in my second screen. So um, I'm just looking if there is anything. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for giving this presentation. It was super interesting, and I think everyone learned a lot about your work. Sounds good. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, the, oh, here we have a question. If it sounds really interesting, uh, uh, will a computer science uh, major allow me to get into this? Oh, uh, this is a question from, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, uh, Skrila. Well, I, I don't know, uh, Manoj, um, um, this is a great question. So uh, if I'm studying computer science, can I get into this? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Um, actually, I, well, I myself, I come from uh, an electrical and computer engineering uh, background, and I've really dived into that. Uh, the digital medicine uh, will be, a tight collaboration between clinicians and computer scientists. None of the two can do the work uh, without the other one. So we really need computer scientists to work uh, in, in digital medicine. And um, as a matter of fact, at, uh, at Scripps Research, uh, I am actually recruiting uh, a lot of computer scientists now, mostly uh, people with um, graduate uh, students who want to spend some time in my lab, but we are looking also at postdocs and PhD students uh, who want to work in that. The analysis of this data can only be done with the techniques you will learn uh, in a computer uh, science uh, um, for bachelor and then eventually master degree. So definitely uh, we need them and uh, the techniques you learn there, the coding and all the, the great skill you learn there will be used uh, uh, in, in, in medicine. And you don't need to be an expert in, in physiology to enter this field. You need to have the technical background that you learn in, a, in computer science. And then, uh, of course, you need to have a passion for working with, uh, with this different type of data. Um, I have a postdoc, for example, working with me uh, who, you know, got a PhD actually in computer science and, and he just got passionate about that and uh, he's doing a fantastic job now. Um, where can I research more about COVID-19 biosensor? Do you have any reliable source? Uh, well, I'll, I would suggest you to, um, to get a look at some of, uh, of the papers we have um, uh, that, that have been published there are a couple of them um, that are really interesting so um, there are two things um, you have uh, my contact here uh, Sophie you have my contact here in the in the slide um, and don't be shy just um, shoot me an email or you can follow me on Twitter at the George Square but you can also shoot me an email at gqer at scripts.edu I'll be happy actually uh, guys to provide you some some references and uh, um, for for this and uh, let me see if 
Uh, can you still see the screen, right? Um, you know, here there are a bunch really of papers first on AI and this one in particular about um, wearables and, and COVID-19. So uh, I would definitely start from there. And if you can, uh, if you cannot uh, access the paper, some of them are restricted. Again, um, I'm happy to help. So just shoot me an email and I can send you the paper. Uh, thank you very much, Zoran. You thank us very much for a lot. You explained the interest in science, not in self and other an easy way. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Adawite. Thank you. I'm looking forward to learning more about this interesting topic. So, uh, again, thank you so much. This is my email if you have specific questions. I'm, I'm really happy to provide you papers if you want to read them. So, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll try to answer as soon as possible. And uh, if you're interested in the topic, again, I suggest Twitter is, is a great point. I know uh, it's not so, uh, so used uh, for especially young people, but it's a great way to spread uh, uh, scientific work. And um, we are quite active on Twitter and we try to post there, um, you know, as, as much as possible, everything that comes out uh, in the science world in this month, especially related to COVID-19, that's, that's the big questions. All right, uh, I think we are a little bit, uh, we are a little bit over, uh, over time. Uh, again, don't be shy, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to, um, to answer you. And uh, I think that concludes my talk. Oh, maybe one last thing. Um, will we have an uh, internship position also for high school students available at Scripps Research over the summer. So you may consider that uh, and um, in case you can get a look at the uh, Scripps Research Translational Institute website or again you can contact me and I'll post something about that also on, on, on Twitter. Uh, but we're talking about that in probably uh, winter or spring quarter of, of this year. Uh, thank you. Yeah, once again, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thanks.